Today I'm going to do a mix addressing some comments and questions that have appeared in my videos and also describing a statement in a Social Security Form 3373 I recently read that illustrated some things to do right and some things not to do that are wrong when you're applying for disability. I get all sorts of interesting comments and questions and I try to answer quite a few of them. I can't answer all and I do get a fair number of comments from what Dr. Jordan Peterson calls sadistic troll demons, more scientifically described as vulnerable narcissists. And I see quite a few of that type doing disability exams and it's going to be the topic of an upcoming video. Hello, I'm John Foster. I'm a medical doctor who does social security disability exams. And as usual, everything I say reflects my own opinions based on my own experience and study and not the opinions of the Social Security Administration or any other medical body. Now, the first question that I got was from a person who was going to have a consultative examination and pain was a major component of their disability. And they said that they were having difficulty describing the pain and what should they do about that. And my reply was, don't worry too much. Doctors see lots and lots of patients with pain and often the patient will say the pain is difficult to describe. We all know what it's like to be poked with a sharp object like a needle or pin because we've all had that happen to us. But although I've seen many patients with menstrual cramps, I've never experienced them and I really don't have a good idea what they feel like. When you're talking about pain, here are the things that are useful to the doctor. And this doesn't just apply to a disability exam. It applies to any visit to the doctor. The first thing is the location of the pain. Where do you feel the pain the most? The second is what's known in medical terms as radiation. Does the pain spread anywhere? The third is the quality. Can you describe what the pain feels like? Does the pain come and go like cramps or is it constant? Next, ag what we call aggravating factors. What things, if any, make the pain worse? And then relieving factors. Are there things that make the pain go away or make it less intense. And then duration. When you get the pain, how long will it last? Is it seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years? And fi finally, are there any associated symptoms? When you get the pain, do you get problems like sweating, shortness of breath, vomiting, etc., etc. For a disability exam, the most important thing that you must describe is how does the pain limit your work-related abilities? Because if it doesn't limit your ability to work, it's not important in a disability exam. And if you're finding this interesting, you might want to give the video a like and subscribe to my channel. I generally put out one disability related video a week. And if you have questions, you can always put them in the comments. And if it's really interesting or I think it might help other people, I may do a video on the question. The next question was a doctor who wanted to get involved doing social security disability exams and wanted to know where to find reading material to study up on the subject. And unfortunately, there's almost no information. The best source I have found is the social security website and I've done a lot of reading on the website because that's where I've found what social security considers important. 
out of curiosity, I went to Amazon and looked for books on disability. And I found a whole lot of books written by people who are disabled talking about their rights. Interestingly enough, there were zero books about the responsibilities of people who are disabled, which probably reflects our modern Western culture. Then there were a lot of books on learning disabilities for teachers and school administrators. I found only one book written by a doctor which was intended for patients telling them how to prepare for a disability exam. And as an aside, one thing I've always noted is whenever there's a photograph of a doctor for a publication, they always have a stethoscope around a doctor's neck and it's always the lousiest, cheapest stethoscope you can buy. The stethoscope the doctor was pictured wearing on the cover of this book I found for sale on Ally Express for $2.90 with free shipping. Actual medical stethoscopes range from about $100 to $500 each. The next thing is apparently a lot of people posting in the comments have not watched any of my videos because I get the same question over and over and over again. I have condition X or I have three herniated discs. Will I be approved for disability? And as I've mentioned so many times before, but I think needs to be mentioned again, disability applications are not approved or denied based on diagnosis, except in some rare circumstances, or test results. Disability exams are based on how your medical problems limit your ability to work. You must address that question. How do your medical problems limit your ability to work? The next topic is I read this statement on a Social Security Form 3373 recently. See if you can figure out what this person did right and what they did wrong. The statement was handwritten and the handwriting was legible. And the person had written, I can't lift, twist, reach, kneel, bend. It hurts every time I try to do something physical. Well, the thing that this person did right that many disability applicants don't do is they addressed work-related limitations. The ability to lift, twist, reach, etc. are all things that are necessary for certain jobs and all things that Social Security is interested in. They did two things wrong. Number one, they didn't address exactly why they can't do those certain things and how severe their limitation is. For example, if you have trouble lifting, is it because you're weak? Is it because your back hurts? Is it because your shoulder hurts, etc.? It's important that you convey that information to Social Security. The second big mistake they made is they were exaggerating. Remember, it said, I can't lift, but the person was able to lift a pen and write on a piece of paper. Now you're going to say, well, that's ridiculous. Anybody can lift a pen. Well, remember, I'm a doctor who does disability exams. In the past year, I've seen two gentlemen applying for disability because they'd suffered strokes. And in a stroke, usually one side of the body becomes weak, usually not completely paralyzed. But both of these men had suffered severe strokes so that one of their arms was completely paralyzed. They couldn't even twitch a muscle. 
they were absolutely unable to hold a pen or write with their paralyzed arm. And when you say, I can't lift, if you can lift a pen, you're exaggerating. You must be specific. If you can't lift more than 10 pounds, then say, I can't lift more than 10 pounds. If you can't lift more than two pounds, say, I can't lift more than two pounds. But if you can lift anything at all, saying, I can't lift is an exaggeration. Next, I got a very angry comment, one of many that I've seen on this topic, saying that I'm a terrible person because I doubt some people's story of their pain and that I should believe everyone when they say that they have pain. And I often wonder where are these people coming from? Are they stupid? Are they naive? Are they mentally ill? Or are they lying? The fact is, anytime there's something of value, some people will lie, cheat, and steal to obtain it. The four things people tend to value most are money, power, sex, and intoxicating substances. Now, you don't get power or sex from being disabled, but you certainly can get money, and in many situations, intoxicating substances. Most of the patients I see for disability exams are being honest, but I see a significant minority who are pretending and lying, and it's part of my job to identify those folks so they don't steal money from the really disabled. Let me give you a perfect example of a patient who lied about their pain and actually fooled me. Quite some time ago, I was practicing emergency medicine in a steel mill town. I had a man come in and tell me that he was passing a kidney stone, and he appeared to be in terrible pain. And as anyone who's had a kidney stone knows, it's one of the worst pains you can feel. I had him provide a urine specimen, and the urine specimen was pink. It had blood in it, which is characteristic of somebody passing a kidney stone. The kidney stone scrapes the inside of the urinary tract, causing it to bleed. So, of course, I had the nurse give him an injection of a very powerful narcotic. Now, when somebody's trying to pass a kidney stone, you want to get the stone, if at all possible, because checking the stone in the lab, there are several different types, will help you decide on the best treatment to prevent further kidney stones. The patient then went to the restroom again and came back and said he'd passed a stone, and sure enough, he had a little piece of hard material that looked exactly like a kidney stone. I had the stone sent off to the laboratory, which is what you do when a patient passes a kidney stone. He felt much better and he went home. A couple of days later, the laboratory report came back showing that this purported kidney stone was actually a piece of iron ore. This patient had picked up a little piece of slag from the ground and put it in his pocket before he went to the ER. He'd also brought a pin, a pin or needle, and when he went into the bathroom, he pricked his finger so he could put a drop of blood in his urine. And then the second time he went to the bathroom, he put his piece of slag in the urine container and claimed it was a kidney stone. Complete and utter fabrication and lying from start to finish. People who haven't known or experienced prescription drug addicts simply cannot believe the lengths that they will go to in order to obtain their substances of choice. There is a person I found influential in my life called Ed Lattimore, and he's a black man who grew up in the ghetto, living with his single mother who was a drug addict. 
and in his early 20s he found himself in a dead-end job drinking alcoholically and decided that he'd had enough. So he enlisted in the army to straighten himself out. When his enlistment was up, he used funds provided by the army to get a degree in mathematics and physics and became a mathematics and physics tutor. At the same time, he became a ranked international chess player and a professional heavyweight boxer. The, those sort of accomplishments are astonishing for someone who grew up in the worst of circumstances, but he managed to do it. He has a successful book available on Amazon. It's called Not Caring What Other People Think is a Superpower, and I'm going to put a link to it in the description of this video. And one of his pieces of advice is that you should have the work ethic of a crackhead. He says nobody works harder than a crackhead who needs a rock. They will work 24 hours a day, seven days a week until they can get their fix of crack. And from what I've seen of prescription drug addicts, that's true of some of them. Well, I hope this has been helpful. Keep the questions and comments coming, and as always, remember, if it happens, it's possible. Mm -hmm.